All right, looks like we've got quite a few people who've joined, so I think it's a good time to get started here. Uh, so let me just go ahead and kick us off. Thank you to everyone for taking the time to join. Uh, this is officially the first episode of Merging Domain, and we are just super excited to have everyone joining us today. Uh, we'll have a new episode every month where we'll talk about the different aspects of CICD. So we hope you enjoy today's session. But uh, yeah, you can continue to join us in the future as well, I hope. Uh, just a housekeeping reminder here that it is an interactive session. So please feel free to submit any questions that you have, and we'll actually do our best to tackle them live. Um, so just go ahead and hit the Q&A button, and you can add anything you want in there. Um, joining me today is JJ Askar. He's a developer advocate at IBM. He has worked with numerous companies in the technology sector, such as Dell, Hewlett Packard, University of Texas, and more. And we brought him on today because he's a seasoned veteran who has experienced every side of the modernization process as a consultant, architect, engineer, DevOps engineer, and evangelist. So without further ado, uh, JJ, are you ready to get started? Yes, sir. How are you? Good, good. Yeah, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, this is pretty exciting to have you on, and, and yeah, it's cool that you're helping us kick off this series, so we just really appreciate you being here. Um, so yeah. do you want to give us any more info about yourself, I guess, before we jump in? Yeah, yeah, cool. Uh, yes, well, first of all, thank you for having me. Um, I'm just your typical nerd, right? <laughs> like, I, <laughs> I, I like playing with Orange with technology, and uh, I was privileged enough to make it my career. Uh, and to, to parrot what you said, um, I've spent a lot of time in the CI and CD space. Um, I've seen some some very bad decisions made, <laughs> seen some very good decisions made. Um, so hopefully in this conversation, we can highlight some of those so uh, your audience here can can take something away and really understand that uh, it's a journey. And um, the ultimate goal is the velocity that you're looking for. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And uh, I will say I am fortunate or maybe unfortunate, I'm not sure, to have also experienced some of these, uh, you know, great successes <laughs> and failures as well. Um, you know, I've been fortunate to be exposed to many companies kind of in CICD now in general. And it's, it's always interesting to see how different each experience is. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they're, they're so varied. Um, so I do want to just, you know, uh, throw a cap on about what today is. So the session today is about modernizing your CICD in general. So it's a very broad topic. Uh, but we felt like it was a really good way to kick off this series uh, because we have a lot of folks that are actually coming to us. You know, they're curious, you know, how do we modernize our CI/CD process? And you can look out there and, and every, you know, company, cloud company, provider, you know, open source tool has its own opinion on what the right CI/CD process is. And I just don't think it's that simple. Um, so we're going to discuss kind of some of the principles of that and just kind of dive in. So uh, the first thing that I wanted to kick it off with is let me just ask you this, JJ. Is a modernization of your CI CD worth it? I mean, that would be the first question. <laughs> like, because it's a lot of effort. So is it actually worth it? Uh well, you know, um, yes. <laughs> that's the <laughs> that's that's the simple answer. Um the so the, the challenge is is nine out of ten times when I talk to a company that is trying to start down this path, um, they are very hesitant to to even start because they're like, well, it works. Like what we're using right now works. Why would we bother changing the pipeline that we, we have? Well, for that matter, do we need a pipeline? Well, first of all, let me answer the second question first, I guess. Yes, you need a <laughs> pipeline. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> definitely. Is, yeah, you, you, you got to trust the robots, right? You got to trust the bots to do the work for you. Um, and if you're starting there, you actually are at an advantage because you can build that pipeline up over time and not, not do everything all at once and be able to gain the velocity in piecemeal fashions. But if you already have a pipeline and you're modernizing it from what you've been doing originally, uh, maybe you're moving from a, a, a monolithic app to a microservice, and now you're having to build a bunch of small pipelines for the different microservices yeah. you're doing or things like that, it's a little bit more complex. But the principles are the same. You start small and you build. Um, I believe in, in the agile ecosystem, we call it uh, small iterative changes or batch, yeah. batch jobs. <laughs> um, there's so many times I have a conversation and I literally, this is one of my, my best playing cards I, I use, which is, I'm sorry, but you're trying to build a car right now. I'm just building a skateboard to get to a bike, to get to a moped, to get to a motorcycle, to get to a car. 
<laughs> yeah, you're definitely. building a car. I don't want to be part of this this conversation because you are going to be fighting over the steering wheel when my little skateboard is already getting us down the street. Yeah, definitely. And and it's kind of funny because it's something that I go back to too. I mean, I refer to it as the crawl walk run approach, uh, which okay. was shared with me, you know, with someone else that I worked with in the past. And it's just so true because I think um, you get a lot of companies that think, you know, whether it's the the application modernization or the CI CD modernization, that they're going to boil the ocean right mm -hmm. away. Uh, it's just not practical, um, you know, in my in my experience. So you have to have those good iterative steps to your point, you know, following that agile methodology to know, hey, what are the right steps to take? And how can I make these steps without burning myself or like the future, you know, decisions that we need to make around this as well? One of the best parts about doing this is if you're moving into the microservices space from a monolithic app. Let's just let's just kind of level set and have that as the, the general narrative. Of course, there's yeah. a billion different ways to skin this cat, but that's the most easiest one to talk about. One of the challenges is in a moving from a, mic, a monolithic app to microservices is that you don't have standardizations between the microservices. Yeah. Believe it or not, your CI platform, whichever you decide to use, can enforce the dis, the, the uh, agreed upon contracts between the microservices. So if you build up a testing framework of doing whatever, um, and you write some tests that expect this API to be here and this API to be there, you do that in your CI pi pipeline to make yeah. sure that it is there. And now all of a sudden, every time you commit, your bots make sure that that thing is there. So your microservices is a little bit more stable. It, right. Your, your CI becomes your comfort blanket, and it's so important. Yeah, I mean, baking in those guardrails, right, uh, to your point. Uh, so we have an interesting uh, comment in the chat, and I think, you know, you had mentioned, um, you know, the most important thing is to trust the robots, right? <laughs> so in this, you know, this individual says, hey, you know, can you speak to points that I can make to my team to help lead them down that modernization path? And I think one of the most important things to point out is you do need to get them to trust those robots. You need them to trust the automation and that it's going to improve things for you. Um, you know, in your experience, JJ, do you work with organizations that are resistant to automation? Uh, <laughs> like what, you know, and, and in your experience, like what's the best way to convince them that it should be a focus for them, a core focus? Um, the best example I have is uh, I was working in a small rail shop for a little while and um, there was so much bike shedding around, um, uh, code, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, code formatting, right? Oh yeah. There was, <laughs> yeah, there's so, I mean, every, everybody, you know, tabs versus spaces and all that, all that <laughs> stuff. Right. Well, believe it or not, the best way to convince somebody to finally give into that whole problem is something like, you know, pep eight or Rubucop or whatever winter you want to use. I've, I know there's one in the node space and I'm blanking at the time this, this moment. Um, but the beauty of it is, is if you put that linter in your CI platform, platform and pi pipeline and have it run on all your code at the same time, now nobody can argue anymore because yeah. you've agreed upon this is the formatting we're doing and the computer is going to enforce that. Okay, hey, you trust in the computer to do that thing for you automatically to enforce the things that you have been agreed upon as your coding standards. That is a first step to allowing the bots to do more work for you. Yeah. Then I'm, I'm a Python developer, right? Like that's, I just kind of landed on Python. I haven't really <laughs> moved away from it recently. And PyTest is amazing, right? Yeah. Like PyTest is legit awesome. As soon as you realize you can leverage PyTest in your pipeline to do the work for you, now you've got Pep8 going through everything or, or Flake or whatever, Flake8 or whatever you want to do. And then now you're doing a little PyTest inside of it to verify that. Now, the cognitive overhead of making sure your shit works now is gone because the bots right. do the work for you. Right. Yeah. And I mean, that's, you know, Alan, I hope we're going to be able to swing back around to it. Cause I do want to talk about cultural changes as well. And that goes hand in hand with this too. Um, you know, in, in my experience, um, what JJ is saying about baking it into the build process, uh, it, it's amazing. It's exactly the stuff that you need to do and build it into the pipeline process to ensure that you set up the gates so that the developers, know very obviously that it's going to break and they cannot get any further until they solve the problem. The unfortunate side effect, which I hope we'll swing back around to, is uh, the cultural impact of that, which is you're going to have pushback. Um, I, I think that's fair to say. Uh, 
so i guess i do uh do you have an answer for that one jj like uh yeah, yeah so the question just popped in in the q a which is is there a js equivalent of pytest and yes there is and i am completely Completely blanking on it at this exact moment in time. <laughs> so if you um, can, we can we pull that to uh, reach out to them at the end of the the thing. A, a simple Google search should bring it right up. But I yeah. am completely blanking on the name right now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, the the fact is, you know, for every pi test that there is, there's that in other languages, right? There's linters, um, there's testing suites that are all built around, you know, being able to bake this stuff directly into a pipeline into your CI CD process. Uh, so I think you're not going to have any limitations on the JavaScript side. It just depends on, you know, JavaScript has a lot of flavors. Like if you're using TypeScript, you're going to use, you know, Karma or something, right? You're going to have specific testing suites that align with the technology that you're using. Um, but the answer is absolutely yes. They're there. You know, you should be able to utilize them. So I guess I Google, do. Go ahead. Oh, did you Google it, JJ? What is yeah, it? yeah, and and it, it popped up as Jest, but I don't want to say that's the one that I was thinking of. No, so, yeah, no, it's something else. But yeah, sorry, yeah, I had another screen and I was I was already jumping on. <laughs> yeah, that that's not the one I'm thinking of. I mean, so again, JavaScript is you know there's so many different <laughs> forms of JavaScript that I feel like it's dependent on what you're specifically using. Um, so let's let's tackle a part of the modernization though. So you have a lot of companies that are doing application architecture modernizations. To your point, you know, you're saying we're level setting at moving from monoliths to microservices mm -hmm. as like kind of a baseline of where companies are. And, and let's be honest, that's been happening for seven plus years. You know, and before that, it had some form of notion of being called SOA and it, it really mm -hmm. modernized into microservices. But with that said, can you do the modernization on the application architecture side without changing your CI CD? The simple answer is no, um, mainly because as you start breaking up your monolithic application, you need some level of guardrail um, yeah. to make sure that you keep up with the same level of your monolithic app as it moves to microservices. And again, that goes back to trust in the bots, right? The, the bots are the guardrails and the guardrails make sure that your application comes out on the other side of that micro uh, that the monolithic to microservice rearchitecture um, in a safe manner. Because don't forget, and a lot of people forget this, why are you writing software? You're writing software to make money, right? You're not probably doing this for fun. I mean, okay, granted, I'm an open source engineer. Of course, I write my own software for fun. Some of us do but, it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But the majority of us, this is our job, right? Like we're doing this to make money for the business. So the longer you take without the guardrails if, to Alan's point of doing things by hand, by not having those guardrails, you are putting your, your, your business at risk by not leveraging yeah. the automation to make sure it's repeatable and item potent. Yeah, for sure. And Calvin, your question is really interesting. Is there a good way to measure if my CI CD is good enough? Um, so first of all, I think Looking at things like Dora metrics can be very, very helpful because it's really a measure of your software build and delivery efficiency over time. Uh, what I would say is a modern pipeline is going to look very, very different depending on the technology, the organization, um, and what you want to utilize. And some are going to say, oh, well, modern pipeline is GitOps. And some are going to say, oh, a modern pipeline is, you know, we're delivering to serverless at the end of the day. Um, but what I will say is if you can track it and improve it and you can create experts in an easy manner within your CI CD process. Um, and it's not keeping you from delivering your software at the frequency that your developers can make changes, then you're doing pretty good as far as modern CI CD goes. But if there's a point where you feel like the CI CD process is holding up, you know, the developers on the work that they're delivering, then I feel like you, you've got more work to do for sure. And, and it's never going to be perfect. But you know, again, you want to get to the point to where the CI CD is a seamless process on top of the development process. Um, that's the end goal. It's always going to be challenging to get there, but that's my perspective. I don't know how you feel about it, JJ, but that's kind of where I'm at. I just put the greatest thing about our jobs into the chat, which is XKCD 303, right? It is a wonderful joke about the number one programmer's excuse for legitimately slacking off. My code is compiling, <laughs> right? <laughs> Now, the idea of your CI pipeline, your CD pipeline, or let's call it, let's, let me be very clear, CI. We're not going to talk about I mean, CD as much as I'd love to say CD is a nirvana that you need to reach. CD, which is continuous delivery, 
is a thing that requires a significant amount of um, maturity that frankly, a lot of companies I talk to do not have. You for, might true, think for true continuous delivery, right? You're saying correct, like fully automated. True. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> there is so many things going on there that it is a nirvana. It is great. But let's, 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 when we say CI, we're talking about continuous integration with code coming along with testing to make sure that you get the velocity you need. Your goal is not to have XKCD 303, right? You do not want to have be able to sit there and, and play with Nerf guns in the office, assuming you're going into the office. Um, you want to be able to iterate quickly and see errors at, uh, as fast as you can. So in my mind, the way I teach people how to embrace CI is your local testing, you should have some way to, to do local debug testing. And then what a larger integration test happens when you push that PR up into whatever uh, system you're using to do those deeper tests to make sure that yeah. it is what you expect it to be. So when it turns green, all you got to do is hit that big green button, you merge to main. Hey, I, I first first to use it. <laughs> Nailed on, it. <laughs> on the, on, yep. Um, and, and then your, your teammates can pull that new code down and continue working on what they need to. It's yeah. all about velocity. CI is about velocity and you've yeah. got to f focus on that. Yeah. And I mean, honestly, to a bigger extent, again, you know, I think we know there are gaps doing true continuous delivery for companies, but CD is also about velocity. Um, and that's why most companies are trying to get to that fully automated continuous delivery because time to market matters. I mean, even if you have internal customers, you know, you might be at a big shop that has internal customers, that time to market matters, uh, you know, with the way that people look at you internally, um, your own role there, you know, how you're viewed as a success or not. Uh, so I think it's very important. I do want to touch on a couple of Q&A things that came in. So Adrian, you said, how much coverage? You know, are there any ideas beyond mere line branch coverage? So first of all, I think this is something JJ and I align on. Um, the 100% test coverage idea is, it's impossible. Uh, I think that expect like, and it gets worse depending on the language. Like let's say that you're using Java and there's a ton of boilerplate as we know there is, like if you're doing spring or rest data services or something like that, a lot of that isn't necessarily testable and getting to that 100% test coverage isn't a valid use case. I mean, it's great, you know, but it's not valid. Um, what I've used in the past with my teams um, on like Java and uh, Angular and React is I've shot for anywhere between 70 to 80% test, test coverage is what I felt like is a pretty good bar. And that's actually still pretty high, if I'm being honest, because there's still a lot of boilerplate code in there. Um, and then as far as beyond mere line branch coverage, I think tools that actually do proper linting and do code smells can be very helpful. Uh, you want that as a part of your process. Because you may not realize it, but you're actually using a feature that's deprecated and it's going to bite you like, you know, six months from now when they rolled out a language, when you move up to the next version, right? And that, those linting tools to help you to keep you ahead of that game a little bit. So that's kind of my perspective on that. I don't know what you think, JJ, but like, you know, it, it's, it's a little bit of a moving target as far as test coverage goes, but that's where I'm at. I agree wholeheartedly. Like, I couldn't have said it better. <laughs> like, 100% test coverage is a complete and utter, and to use Raleigh's point, fallacy, right? Like, it's yeah. it's just, like, if your boss is telling you to get 100% test coverage, first of all, frankly speaking, if I'm, we're speaking to you, you're probably already relatively seasoned in the industry, right? Yeah. Frankly speaking, like, you're probably, if, if not intermediate, senior. If you're junior, even better. Awesome that you're lo looking into this. Th thank you for being here. But most of us have probably already been seasoned in here. And if they're telling you to do 100% 100, 100 test coverage, your engineering manager is, first of all, they're probably not a very good engineering manager because they're asking you to do busy work, right? Like, what is it going to gain? Honestly, like, if anything, it's just overhead. You, you should be focusing on getting features out the door. Yeah. And again, it, it just impacts your velocity, right? So, I mean, at the end of exactly. the day... Like the focus is delivering features. And I know, you know, you're going to have DevOps engineers, you're going to have platform team. You're like, no, my, my goal is reliable environments. My goal is, you know, getting their software out there. But I'm sorry, but DevOps and platform folks, you are measured by the velocity of those features being delivered into the environments that they need to be in. Um, so you're just as tied to those developers as they are to you. Um, and so I think it's very important that you focus on that velocity aspect. And to me, that means when you're talking about test coverage, you don't put anything in place that is going to bring stuff to a standstill if it doesn't greatly benefit. 
Um, and it, it needs to, it needs to be measurable benefits, right? Like if you're going to say, I'm going to throw some number out there, like 80, 85% test coverage, you better have good reasons for that. And you better have the information to back it up and the data to back it up that it's actually improving. things. Because otherwise you're going to create, you know, turmoil within the company, political, like just don't go down that path is my recommendation. <laughs> there something be dragons. Reasonable. There'll yeah, be there'll dragons. be dragons. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like I think that is the most important thing you can uh, think of there. Um, so that, yeah, I mean, that was a great answer, JJ, as far as like, you know, modernizing your CI CD when you're doing an application architecture modernization. Do you think that the architecture that is chosen dictates the CI CD solution? Or do you think it's a little bit the other way around as well? Um, in, in the conversations I've had in general is it should be built up um, in parallel as you're moving down the path of uh, re-architecting your application from monolithic to microservices or adding a new microservice. There's a lot of stories about one pipelines and, and a lot of those jazz and cool new technologies. A lot of companies that I've seen, again, that's a maturity conversation that they're trying, you're, you're trying to um, get them to get to. Practically speaking, what is one of, one of the best uh, um, uh, axioms in our industry? the most permanent solution is temporary or whatever, <laughs> you know, when you write a little yeah. temporary code to do something, you Always. just never change it. Yeah. Um, I, I believe that as true to my soul, right. That that always happens because people need to move forward. Like to the meantime, to the, uh, to, to the business is super important. Right. So sometimes you're gonna have to make some bad choices to get the product or the, the, the feature out. Well, if you're building up your pipeline in parallel with it to make sure that you you have a standardized uh, contracts, you have standardized ways of doing all the work, it'll just naturally grow. But it is a organic thing, right? So eventually you're gonna have to revisit your pipeline to say, okay, do we actually need to check A, B, and C thing now? Do we actually need to dig into the code to look for these unit tests or whatever? because we always know that this will work. Like we haven't touched this stuff in two years. Yeah. Okay, maybe we can roll that out into a monthly test or something like that. Because you don't always just test new code, you should do regression testing. We haven't even yeah. talked about regression testing yet, right? Like <laughs> you should have a cadence that you have a larger test, test um, uh, suite that, that you run on your code to make sure that it does, but those are also long-term tests, right? Like it's no longer do we have the little screen in our office and we have the little dunce hat that when they build, break the build, you put the dunce hat on. No, <laughs> if they break the build, actually that's probably a good thing because yeah. that means something's changed. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, I anyway. mean, it, if you have 100% build success, right? That's not a good sign, JJ. It means you're not that's doing not. enough rigorous testing in the pipeline process, right? <laughs> exactly. exactly. Um, and I and I think that goes to like something that Raleigh put in the comments here. And I think that went to us, which is, you know, velocity is just part of it. You actually need to focus on quality, too. I, I mean, I totally agree. I have to say that I feel like quality is um, it should go without saying uh, if you're at an organization that doesn't respect software quality or it's not an important key metric, I would be very concerned for where you're developing at um, because, you know, I, I don't I don't think it's a healthy thing to be at a company where if you release a bug, you know, heads will roll. But I definitely think you should be at a company that releases software. And when there's a serious bug, you have a good retrospective about it and understand how to not end up in that situation again. The quality is absolutely paramount. Um, and you want to build as much of that into your point into that CI CD process as possible. Uh, and I, one other comment I want to say, so Alan said, you know, he, he quoted you again, that there's nothing more permanent than a temporary solution. I've, I also have to say, I unfortunately have been responsible for delivering compromise solutions, <laughs> you know, not intentionally, but due to time and pressure above me, you know, and I think a lot of people end up in that situation. Um, I think it's important that if you can try to catalog all those things that you've done like that, or that your teams have done like that in your mind, and try to bake in time. I mean, I know everyone, you know, likes to joke about hardening sprints. But honestly, if you can, Try to do something like a hardening sprint and and you know make some improvements to those areas that you know you had to make compromises there was a um a previous company I, I spoke with they actually had a really clever idea is that those temporary um fixes they they had a social contract that they had always put a to-do line in it 
to mark this was going to be temporary. And part of their CI platform was to grep through all of their code looking for those to-do lines. It didn't break the build. It didn't do an exit zero or exit one. It did an exit zero on it, but you hmm. could go through and track the to-dos that were in the code that were like, oh, we should probably revisit this one day. And they were able to say, okay, you know, this is a small change, blah, blah, blah. But it was enough for them to actually see over time that, that, that chart change and then go back and revisit the, the things that were the temporary solution. It's a yeah. simple answer and it doesn't hurt anybody, but at least gives visibility and observability into your code. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, Adrian, he asked, you know, can we show some hands-on CI examples? So we'll actually have additional webinars coming up, uh, one in a couple of weeks that's going to do a deep dive into, or I guess it's a, a few, um, I don't know, it's in a little while, but anyway, we'll have another mm -hmm. webinar coming up that's doing a deep dive into like five deployment, build and deployment patterns that I think will be perfect. for. Um, so I would highly encourage you to join and, and see that. Here we're mostly discussing practices, you know, architectural patterns, that kind of stuff at a high level. Um, Harsha asks, how frequent can we do continuous testing? Uh, I'll, I would love to hand that over to you, JJ. <laughs> Did, didn't you just answer your own question? Yeah. It's continuous, <laughs> right? <Yeah. laughs> like, like, frankly, well, okay, let's go, let's go back to the, uh, what's the old story? Um, uh, baby, dad, grandfather, backups. Did you remember that one of those terms or the oh, daily, yeah. weekly, yep. monthly backups. Like there, there's a bunch of different terms for it. It's basically three different tiers, right? Yep. Um, however you want to describe it. And in my mind, you have your continuous testing locally, right? You have some unit tests that run locally to a uh, quick feedback loop for what you're doing. Uh, right. There's a lot of, diff there's watcher applications out there that have your app running and will run tests every time you save on your, on your stuff. Like that's quick feedback to understand what's going on. Then when you push your stuff up into your, your, your code repository, you have the, the more in-depth integration testing. And yeah. usually it's a larger, larger path of making sure all the stuff happens. There's probably a better fake database inside of there for your, your development work that has more test cases that you would have, than, than you would have locally or something like that. Sure. Or maybe yeah. you could even have a separate environment that has customer data that's been uh, sanitized. So you can run your code against that kind of stuff. Uh, I know for a fact, CodeFresh has abilities to do this kind of stuff, which is one of the reasons why I had no problem with coming on this, this, <laughs> this talk, because I, I like y'all a lot. I really do. Um, and then third, you have the larger regression testing, right? Where yeah. you build a massive test suite. People used to call this QA, right? Like the QA people. Um, would do all these testing like by uh, Excel spreadsheets, copying, pasting things in, right? Yeah. Um, there's a company that starts with an I and ends with a M that I might know very well that I know for a fact, we still have some of those people who do that, right? Yeah. But we need, we are trying to build the, um, the integration testing and the regression testing. So our software and our bots can do our work, which brings right. us all the way back to the original statement where we've got to trust, trust the bots. Right. Yeah. And I think it's it's a bit challenging because, you know, continuous testing until you get to a point in your automation um, or even your tool set, to be honest, that you you have built out really good scripts that you feel like validate your use cases appropriately, do valid testing against your APIs, you know, basically cross, you know, all the T's and dots, the I's. Uh, you're going to feel like it's a very manual process uh, and it probably will be for a while, but I still don't think it should be left behind because it's creating pain that you know you need to solve with automation, <laughs> which is a good thing because everyone needs to feel that pain to make it a priority. Um, so I think someone answered in the chat and basically said, hey, like, you know, continuous testing is every check-in. I, I think that's fair to say, right? You should be doing it on every check-in. Um, and even now, the only thing that I will say that kind of puts it up in the air is uh, a lot of companies will say, well, you know, we don't do it on our feature branches. Um, you know, we don't, we don't do that until we're ready to merge the code into something. You know, and, and I think it depends on your process and your branching strategy. And there are some cases where the local testing, to JJ's earlier point, has to take precedent over that. And that's fine, especially if you have resource constraints. But understand when you get to the point that you're actually integrating the code, you should have these large test suites running and validating the use cases. 
Um, and if you don't, you're going to experience that pain later on as you get further up into the environments, and it's just going to be way worse. Um, we got a lot of questions coming in, so let's see. I would love to answer the uh, junior developer question. Yeah, go for it. Um, so, so Herbert, uh, I'm a junior developer, and I need to acquire CI and CD skills. Do you have any recommendations on CIDC resources, books, uh, courses, or developers? Uh, frankly speaking, uh, just start using it, <laughs> right? <laughs> like um, you, you, the, the beautiful part about CI and CD skills is that it, if you, especially as a junior developer, if you are just willing to just jump into it and learn how to use a testing suite, um, like I was saying earlier with Python, you know, PyTest or whatever, um, or unit test inside of Python, if you want to go uh, with a standard lib. Um, the, as soon as you just start putting testing as part of your, uh, as soon as you do it as part of your system or your, is your thought process, then you need a way to automate it. And that is what CI is. In, in the easiest way of describing it, CI is automated testing, right? So if you have already have a testing mindset and then you leverage a CI platform to revalidate your testing, and give you a nice big green checkbox or green picture, uh, doesn't really matter. You know what I'm trying to say. Then you'd be amazed on the skills you'll gain from that. Yeah, yeah. Tutorials are great. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I mean, using it is always the right answer. I think one of the challenges, that, particularly for junior developers, and I hope that there are programs that do this, but for people who go through the traditional route and go to college and you know do computer science or MIS or whatever it is, uh, you don't get experience with those CI CD tools there. So you hit the industry and it's a shock to realize that just developing your software is only a small part of actually getting your <laughs> software changes out there. Um, so I think even just setting up, you know, an instance of like a CI CD process on your own and just playing around with it a little bit is going to go a long way. There's also a lot of other good webinars that are more like here's implementation specific details about how we're going to do this. Uh, that you could find out there are YouTube videos that do a pretty good job of this stuff. Um, but nothing beats actually, you know, playing with it and experiencing it yourself. Um, and again, it is a bit of a, in my mind for junior developers, it's a bit of a gap that we have in education. Um, and, uh, you know, maybe we'll start to make that more part of the education process. But as of right now, it's, it hasn't been there as far as I know. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, and, and you'll discover too, that the CI platforms that you see uh, are drastically different for each company you work at, yeah. um, you, you will, you will find there are people do things in very different ways and, um, you will have to be learned to be, uh, as ad as, as what's a good word for it? Not agile, um, flexible, as flexible yeah. as you can be, because you will discover different ways of doing things in different places. Yeah. You will notice patterns that carry across most companies that you would go to, but again, the tooling, the actual process, you know, the scripts they might have in place, what's, <clears throat> and there's always these sort of skeletons in the closet of what still isn't automated. You know, what are the manual processes that like only Bob, you know, two rows over knows about? Mm -hmm. uh, that'll be different at every company. But like in general, once you understand, you know, some good practices and principles to kind of build off of, you can start to see that translate across companies, but you're still going to have that gap of learning what theirs is. And that's, that's going to be difficult. Um, so Tarun asked a really interesting question. You know, most of these initiatives for like modernization and, and CICD and also just application architecture, they start as grassroots or sort of like a skunk works group uh, within a organization. Um, what I will say is, while that is the case, um, even if it starts out of sort of a skunk works or a, a grassroots, um, what you need to know is that the people that are going to make the decisions in your company are the ones that you want to target with data that backs up why you want to do something. <clears throat> mm -hmm. I think it's not a fun answer. I know <laughs> it's not something you're going to go, oh, that's not fun engineering stuff to do. But unfortunately, you need to be able to gather data and prove that, you know, making these changes are going to benefit the company. That's kind of all there is to it. <clears throat> to, to yes and that. Um... One of the most powerful things I learned uh, from my engineering background was as soon as I could show a dollar amount of how much money I would save the company if we went down a path and leverage the technology, all of a sudden people's ears per perked up. It's as simple, simply said, as soon as I showed how to use an Excel spreadsheet of 
you know, I have to do X, Y, and Z thing by hand every single day. Now, I don't, I just have to push this here and it, it kicks off a bunch of tests for me. And now that just saves me n number of hours a week. Right. Those are, those are hours that I could be, you know, frankly, now in meetings, but that's a different conversation for a different time. Mm -hmm. um, now I could be working on these other problems. And it's not just grassroots. It becomes, you have to sell it. You sell it in a way that you show you're saving money and you have to take the initiative too, right? Like a lot of these things, a lot of this modernization path requires initiative from the engineers to actually care about doing it. Right. Um, yeah. You got to get buy-in. Exactly. Right? Exactly. Good way of putting it. Yes. Yeah. I mean, you have to have that buy-in. All right. So this is an interesting question. Uh, feature flags, feature toggles. Yes or no. What do you think? Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> you know, if you, if you are leveraging feature flags correctly, they are amazing. Finding companies that are leveraging it correctly. That's a different story, <laughs> but um, if you can leverage the tooling around feature flags to make your life ability to turn code on and off in a um, simple manner, you will get, uh, you, you, you are already much more mature than most companies out there. Yeah. All right. So here's my hot take for the day. Mm -hmm. Feature flags are an anti-pattern. Uh, okay. just, just straightforward. I mean, in development practices, they are an anti-pattern. That doesn't mean that I think you shouldn't use them or that they're a good fit for some companies. I'm just saying they're an anti pattern and they also lead to unfortunately bad development practices where the stuff doesn't get cleaned up. Mm -hmm. um, so be cautious. <laughs> That's all I'm saying. Like you can use them. They could be very good for you, but be cautious because it can lead you down a hairy road. There be dragons. <laughs> Starting to think you got a title for this, uh, this, this episode, there be dragons. <laughs> yeah, I know. I, I think we're already there. <laughs> Do you want to answer Calvin's question? Sure. Uh, Calvin, any thought on CI, CD taking too long to run? Tests are too flaky. Flaky. I feel like we keep getting breaking our CI, CD pipeline and it ends up slowing us down. Um, that, that, I mean, I hate to, to just go back to the original statement, but that goes back to the local testing, testing, uh, the integration testing that you do when you push up and the larger regression testing. Um, when the CI, CD is taking too long to run, it's a good opportunity to spend a handful of moments, um, maybe during one of your retros or something like that, uh, or maybe even assign someone during a sprint to look at your test suite, right? If it's taking too long to run, there's a reason why. Like it's, it, computers are fast, right? Like that's what they do. They, they're supposed to be fast. So if something weird is happening, it's taking too long to run, spend the time to figure out why, and then build off of that. Maybe you don't need to run that test that's taking two hours to run or whatever, right? Or, or whatever's slowing it down or run that once a week against your main branch instead of every single commit. This is, becomes actually more of a human problem than a technology problem and, and spend that time. Um, to answer the tests are flaky. Yeah, you're just gonna have to leverage whatever, like that, that means your foundation has cracks in it, which means you need yeah. to spend some time with somebody who understands your test suite to be able to go back and revisit it. Yeah. I mean, it, it means there's some work to be done, right? <clears throat> yes. So in general. Exactly. Excuse me. Frog in my throat here. It's all good. <clears throat> uh, Phil, yeah, sorry. I mean, I like feature flags, but, uh, you know, they can be a trap for <laughs> sure. Very, very powerful, though, uh, when used appropriately. So let's see here. Uh, can you please tell me more about static code analysis, security and vulnerability checks in CI? Uh, that there is a lot to tackle there. <laughs> yeah, let, let me. So what you need to look to from <clears throat> this, this angle is in more so than us giving you suggestions of <laughs> software to use, you need to look at it from the other angle of what are you trying to gain, right? We're not gonna go tell you to go use N software because N software is the best one in this case, right? Because first of all, it's a moving target. Security is a moving target. We all know this, especially with the log for J's of the world yeah. and all that jazz or the left pads for that matter. Like it's a moving target and there's not gonna be one all end all be, be all answer. What you're gonna need to do is gonna have to 
visit the what is considered acceptable risk for your business to be able to pick the tooling that will cover that acceptable risk. And then you go to static code analysis tools should be chosen by the developers, which is a, uh, a shared contract through the different teams that say that these are our standards, right? Going back to the linting where you enforce these standards, the stupid tabs versus spaces, right? <laughs> right. That is, that is exactly what you do. You, you as a company, you as an org say, we're all going to spaces because two spaces is the only way to do it. Yes, I'm, I'm on that camp. But um, the, the point being is you agree on that and you put that in your CI pipeline and then nobody argues over it ever again. Right. Can I answer that but, question? But there is, yes, but I mean, I do want to say that there is a level of communication that has to happen internally and agreement. So I don't know if, you know, the companies that you're at have like architectural review boards or, or how you go through this, um, but you have to be able to disseminate that knowledge and decision making throughout the developer organization. Because like, it's a balance between turning things on that are, you know, perfect, let's say for the CI CD process and being pragmatic with the decisions that you're making and how they're going to impact the developers. You got to find a good balance in between there. Um, so I do think it, it did help to answer that. But I think to kind of piggyback on what JJ was saying, you know, depending on your language and, and stuff that you use, you might find different tools that are more valid for your use case. Um, you know, in, in my experience, having a very solid linting tool is good. Uh, using an IDE where you can actually plug in the linting and like mm -hmm. code quality stuff, very helpful, uh, can be critical to the process because a lot of times it means, hey, they can know whether or not their poll request is actually going to get rejected by the build system before they even deliver the code. That's huge. Um, building in the test suites so that in order for them to merge into a branch, they need to actually test that locally. That can help as well. This can be done IDE side, you know, even in like VS code. So that's something to look towards. Um, in regards to security and vulnerabilities, there's a lot of really good tools out there. I mean, you're going to want security and vulnerability testing on your images, on your code, mm -hmm. um, basically in your live environments, even in your lower environments, I would recommend running that stuff and just kind of pick whatever works for, for your organization. One of, the, one of the cool things the cool kids are starting to talk about now is dependency checking, right? Like yeah. we can use all the code in the world and the open source ecosystem slurps up a lot of dependencies when you start looking at it. But we've had this handshake agreement for a very long time that when you pull up a dependency, they look to one dependency below them to make sure that the, there are no major security vulnerabilities, right? Like that's a handshake agreement. I take your dependency, I expected you to whatever dependencies you're using to make sure that they're relatively secure. And it just right. keeps going down the, the, the tree. Well, as we've known now, that is so not the, tr that is so <laughs> not the truth. Um, it is the, no longer the standard practice by any standard. So there are a lot of tooling out there now that actually goes through dependencies to look for major CVEs through those dependency trees from what you're choosing. Right. It gets hairy real fast, and my, I might may I may the might may I say might may I say there be dragons there too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, all right, let's get into into specifically microservices and delivering them on Kubernetes. So, what do you think are the core competencies of building and deploying those services to Kubernetes? The the short of it is um, small batch jobs, right? Uh, if you want to leverage Kubernetes uh, or in, in my world, OpenShift, because I spend more time in OpenShift, but OpenShift is Kubernetes. And so you'll hear me say it both ways, just because I, even though I am wearing an, a Kubernetes t-shirt, by the way. Um, <laughs> Kubernetes uh, with some the, sugar on top, right? For exactly. OpenShift. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. There you go. <laughs> it's not bad. It's not bad. Um, the, the short of it is, is you need small batch jobs, small, small services that do one thing and one thing well. Right back to the old Unix mentality of a tool that does one thing, one thing really well. You need to be able, to, and in that process, now you need to worry about feature creep and feature scope. The reason why I'm mentioning those things now is because things like Argo CD, the GitOps movement in general, allow you to get that those small microservices out as quickly as possible. And yeah. then when you realize that velocity from there, leveraging something like GitOps where um, with Argo CD, where you can control multiple clusters um, across across an ecosystem, 
you can now just change a version in Argo CD, sees the, sees the change, and now you dissipate that whole service across your fleet, and you're now ahead of your business, right? That's a win. That's what we're all looking for because you can get that feature out as quickly as possible. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I think, you know, it's not, it's not necessarily going to be a core competency, but when building and deploying microservices, just make sure that you understand in your Kubernetes environments how you're going to handle your promotion um, mm -hmm. and have very good agreement between the groups that are all involved in this process. Because you might have a server team that, you know, or a platform team or a DevOps team that owns production, you know, the developers could own dev or a sandbox environment, you know, and you have QA that owns your staging or testing or QA environment. Uh, make sure that you have very good understanding of who owns what, where, how you trace issues, and basically, you know, what is the best way to resolve an, un an unknown condition, right? An anomaly that happens in an environment, because I think with microservices, that is very challenging sometimes. Um, particularly if you're used to monoliths, the process to figure this stuff out is way different, for sure. Uh, Ken from Ken, a good friend of mine in the DevOps community, stole a quote from someone else, but I steal a quote from him, which is, "When you start building microservices, you be you 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 become a detective in a mur murder mystery." Yeah. Right. You will have to become a detective because you will have to figure out what went wrong, where, when, why, and how, and you're gonna have to trace that stuff back. Now, there are yeah. a handful of people in this ecosystem that they, they would absolutely love to do that, right? They, <laughs> they watch Sherlock as much as the next person. But the, the idea is in microservices, no longer everything is like centralized, like a, a monolithic app. So yeah. it will force yourself to change debugging how things go. And it's really important to recognize that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and it's, and it's tricky too, because, you know, especially companies that are newly getting into microservices, they may not have experienced like a cascading failure yet. You know, they don't really know what that scenario looks like or, or how to recover from it. Um, and that, you know, your CI CD process in this kind of scenario can be just as critical as the software changes that you make to help alleviate that situation. Because Kubernetes is going to do things like try to auto recover, right? Mm -hmm. It's going to kill off, it's going to kill off the running container and it's going to launch it back up and it's going to kill it off and launch it back up. And ideally, you have some automation in play, place that is smart enough and tied to metrics or, you know, in some cases, log platforms that you might use to know that you're in a situation like this so you can gracefully recover. Uh, and it's not always going to be possible. And some of these lessons are only learned when it's already been too painful. And that's why you learned them. Uh, <laughs> but the reality is in microservices, it's, it's extremely complicated. And like the CICD plays a critical role in this. Um, you have your observability tools. You have your real-time monitoring tools. But guess what? They need to talk to the CI CD in some way to really facilitate the end-to-end -end process. All right, cool. So, so uh, JJ, here's the one that we kind of started on the beginning. But and and we got a couple of questions actually in relation to this. But what are you know the biggest cultural hurdles that uh, you've experienced working with companies that are kind of going through this process? Um, it's the trust. It's yeah. it, and we've said it multiple times, and I'll say it again. You'd be amazed on how many people, like I've seen companies with, with really high up executives mandate things down. I've seen grassroots people start building up systems from the ground up, but there's always this layer inside the, 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 the chain uh, that sometimes people they call middle managers, second line, first line, I don't, it doesn't matter. But there's always this group of people that don't trust the software because they want to know that a human has done something, right? Yeah. They, don't, they don't understand that we live in a world where velocity matters. And for them to hit their goals, they need to remove roadblocks instead of adding roadblocks. And CI is, and CI and CD in general are removing roadblocks so developers can trust the work that they are doing to get it shipped as close as they can to production so a human can release it to production. That last mile though, from, from uh, the most endpoint to production, that CD or continuous delivery or continuous deployment, however you wanna call that word, that is a very long, very long mile, which requires <laughs> a lot of maturity, a lot of cultural changes to understand how that stuff works. That's why we're talking to the lion's share of getting you to 
that starting point of CD. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, you know, it's, it's interesting because like in my, my previous role, we were going through a modernization ourselves on the architecture side, the application architecture side. And uh, I will not say that the CI CD was forgotten, <laughs> but it was definitely a, a latent joiner to the party. <laughs> It was like, okay, we're going to make all of these great, you know, uh, application changes. Um, we're going to start moving to ba basically we're going to microservices, right? And we're making all the decisions around that. And then you start building all that stuff. And you're like, wait, we've got to deliver this. Uh, and mm -hmm. suddenly there's, there's a cultural shock, right? Because you have leadership that is more established in a monolithic release pattern where they're like, we're going to every Sunday at 4 a.m. We're going to do a release of our application and it's all hands on deck. And yeah, I've been that guy, right? I've, I've been, been that guy, guy too. And, yeah, and you're going to be on and you're going to test yep. it and validate it and then and then we're good to go. And now you're saying no, like the whole reason that we want to go to microservices is so that we can have developers push out push out changes as soon as they're ready to increase our velocity, right? And Incle increase our flexibility, our ability to release software quicker. Um and it's just a it's a a Tug of war, really. It's a tug of war between developers wanting to get their changes out there quicker, the project managers wanting to get their changes out there quicker, and the leadership and more established, you know, process in place that has not been that at all. Um, and I think if you don't have some very good sessions and data to back up why you're doing this and the ability to get buy-in from the people that are kind of in that leadership area, it's going to seem like the Wild West. Uh, and and it's, it's likely going to fail. Right. Um, so, I mean, that's just very challenging. <laughs> and it goes back to the conversation of risk, right? Yeah. Where your business is going to need to decide what is the agreed upon amount of risk we're going to take. Yeah. And, and there are businesses out there that we're like, I would, I would hope banks aren't going to, you know, do exactly what, you know, for lack of a better joke, like I can't think of a better joke than Facebook move fast and break things. Right. <laughs> yeah. Like, hopefully my bank doesn't do that. Right. Like, right. I would hope they would control my money in a better way. So it's, you're going to have to, the, the cultural change of adopting these things will, will bristle people. Yeah. But ba back to what, what you were saying, if you have the data to prove how much money you can save, how much time and effort you can save by leveraging automation, because what is this whole conversation been around? been bound for velocity and automation. Yeah. Like that's what we are trying to convince you as an audience is, is the most important part is we want you to do other things than things by hand. <laughs> right. <laughs> we don't want you to have to be the button pusher, you know, from here exactly. until eternity. Be the button maker, not the pusher. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and I think it's important to understand too, like from my perspective and a lot of folks that we work with, um, you know, the amount of acceptable change and also the release schedule is really dependent on that company. You can actually modernize your CICD process and still keep a two week release cadence if that's really what matters to you. Um, obviously it's not what most people would consider like the perfect CICD solution, but the reality is you can do awesome automation and you know fully automate all of your lower environments and still help your developers increase their velocity and still keep a more structured release. Because to your point, if you're a bank, like JJ said, you're not going to release 52 times a day. <laughs> like it, it might just <laughs> not make sense for you or your customers or, you know, and, and your business is reliant on staying secure and reliable and, and all that stuff. So you, you have to weigh kind of the pros and cons there. Um, but in general, I, I do feel like uh, you should always be shooting to try to improve the process, whether that means it's a more frequent release or just more automation to let you do more cool stuff. Like JJ was saying, that's the goal. Right. Let the DevOps people focus on cooler stuff. Let the engineers focus on cooler stuff. Um, yeah, a lot of good stuff there. So we we do have uh, three minutes left here. Um, so JJ, I know, <laughs> I know it's gone so fast. I mean, I could talk about this for hours. Uh, so I think it's a fascinating topic. So we we might have to actually do a follow up episode on this where we do a part two uh, okay. of modernizing your CI/CD. But you know, in the last couple of minutes here, JJ, is there anything that you would say, you know, uh, pieces of wisdom that you want to drop out there? You can drop some bombs and then we'll, we'll go dark. <laughs> well, simply said, um, this stuff is hard, right? Like as much as we talk about all of this, this stuff is hard. And I, I, as a professional who do this day in and day out, I acknowledge this and you will hit this wall eventually. You're like, why is this so hard? This isn't be easy. This should be easy. Well, of course, there are ways of making it easier, but 
need to recognize that this stuff is hard. It takes time. It's a journey. And eventually you'll get you before you realize it, you'll have crossed that hill to get to that mountain, to get to that summit or whatever metaphor you want to use. <laughs> and you'll get the velocity to be able to get where you want to be. It takes time though. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I would totally agree with that. And I would say, uh, prepare yourself for battle. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. That's, that's pretty good. That's pretty yeah. Good. <laughs> from a CICD perspective, from a political perspective within your company, uh, if you're going to be the one spearheading this, yeah. Uh, prepare yourself for battle. Uh, it's, but it's a fun one. I mean, I always found it challenging and interesting to, to improve processes. So I think it's a cool thing to do. Um, so with that said, I should probably wrap us up here. So first of all, thank you so much, JJ, for joining us today. Um, you know, we just loved chatting with you. Uh, is there anything that you want to plug that you got going on recently or upcoming? I, yeah. Um, well, I, I'm a developer advocate, so I do some, I do talks and travel around the world and whatnot. Um, but if you are at scale this year, um, I will be speaking there, uh, which I believe is in a couple of weeks, should be. And then uh, I'll be at KubeCon EU and a couple other places. Uh, my Mastodon is below me there. Um, so never hesitate to follow me there. And I really do have the email address of awesome at ibm.com. Uh, <laughs> so if you actually do want to reach out to me, I have no problem with ever talking about any of this stuff. And uh, my job is to help you. So never hesitate to ask. Yeah, I, I still can't believe you have awesome at ibm.com. It's ridiculous. <laughs> like, I mean, IBM is like, traditionally a conservative organization. So for you to manage yep. to get that uh, email address, you must pull some serious weight there, my friend. Uh -huh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. So thank you to everyone else for tuning in. Um, I hope you took something, you know, useful and informative away from it. Uh, if you enjoyed today's session, we're going to be doing a really cool next one with some folks from Intuit, uh, Anusha Raghunathan and Kevin Downey. And we'll actually talk about GitOps a little bit and where that fits in. So, um, you know, we'll drop a link to the registration page in the chat. We'll have a follow up email that'll have the link to the recording, which I think someone just asked about. And then I think JJ and I, um, I'm able to stay after for a few minutes if people have additional questions. Um, but I think we'll wrap up the main portion of the, the webinar here. Thanks, y'all. Yeah, thank you, everyone. <laughs>